All right. Now I'd like to welcome to the show Professor Richard Salzman, an investment consultant, speaker, professor, author, and capitalist. Welcome to Free the Economy, Richard. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So, so we're here to talk about economics and freedom. Uh, I want to start to say uh, I was really taken by a distinction you made in your recent book, uh, Where Have All the Capitals Gone? Um, you pointed out that when someone supports and believes in socialism, we call that person a socialist. Right. But when someone supports and believes in capitalism, we rarely call that that person a capitalist unless they're also some sort of wealthy business owner. Why do you, Why is that? It's a good question. A capitalist, capital uh, venture capitalist. Uh, yeah, all those terms refer more to a financier. And we know that there are financiers like George Soros who are anti-capitalist. So it is interesting. I think the bottom line answer I would give is that there does not seem to be uh, on the right, I hate to use the word on the right, but let's go with on the right, an equivalent uh, to what's on the left, namely an advocate ideologically of a system. So it's either the capitalism is not seen as an ideological system in the way, say, that socialism is or fascism or any other uh, brand of uh, governance. Uh, and that's a problem, I think. And now, and now even from those who are sympathetic to a free market economy, notice I use the word free market economy, that's to me a, na a narrower conception than capitalism. Uh, but we can do, we can debate this because it has a long terminology, it has a long history to the terminology, but any ism is more systematic, not necessarily a bad thing. It's a kind of systematic uh, attitude toward an, an a analyzing something. And so I, I think capitalism is way more, I also say this in the book, it's way more and it's way better than just an economic system. And we can talk about that, but uh, that's what's missing. That's in the history, that's what's missing. And that's why you can say capitalist and not necessarily go to the idea of the advocate of the system of capitalism. They're also, of course, a rare minority. There are, in, in history, there are many more people who've been advocates of socialism than of capitalism. So that's just a short answer. Well, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time, I'm sure you do too, right? Reading and writing about economics. And, you know, and I yeah. see a sort of interesting dichotomy here. Well, and this, you can see this in, in polling. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of skepticism about capitalism per se, often we use yeah. that word, and certainly about big business. And sometimes surveys right. will use that phrase, big business, which right. is sort of inherently prejudicial, but, you know, sometimes people are skeptical of that. Uh, yet, if you, if you dig down into this, there's often extremely high approval for phrases like entrepreneurship or small business or small business owners even. Is there some triggering point at which business becomes <laughs> too big for people to relate to? Like at, at how, where do we, because you can sometimes a poll will say entrepreneurship yeah. and small business gets approval rate of like 80%, yeah. which is stratospherically yeah. high. Yes. But then you ask them about but big business, it's a tiny people percentage of people who would approve of that. So where, where where do we lose everybody? In every poll I've ever seen, Richard, it's absolutely true in, in Gallup and elsewhere, uh, ranking, you know, either trust in institutions or respect for institutions. And if it's big business and small business, they are completely at op opposite ends of the, the spectrum. Yeah, it, I think it's particularly in America, there's a suspicion of big anything. So even just big government or big labor or big business, it's the, the idea of bigness is badness has always been kind of silly. But I would attribute it actually to the, the socialist kind of Marxist critique of capitalism, which is that it leads to monopolies, that it leads to companies that are, you know, price gouging, um, insensitive to market pressures, not, you know, the whole, you, you know, from economics, the whole perfect competition model is supposed to be many, many, many small uh, sellers, not a few big ones, uh, infinitesimal market share, no pricing power. This is the the kind of litany of no, no advertising, even they can't differentiate their product. They have to have homogeneous products, uh, no sustainable and high profit margins, uh, no barriers to entry. So, so that, that comes from neoclassical economics, but also as a kind of defensive move to say, see Marxists, well, our system doesn't have big business uh, it has these small businesses that you can trust, and uh, they're not going to get into that realm of size uh, leading to these kind of gargantuan, monstrous companies. So so in many ways, that perfect competition model is a kind of a defensiveness. Why not embrace a big business if it's big because it has many satisfied customers? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, in the in the arena of politics, we know if you win in a landslide, some election, they they don't uh, make they're not suspicious of you. They they tell you you have a mandate for governance, <laughs> right? right. Because, but the, isn't that a market share? If you get sixty percent of the vote, it's a big market share. So for Walmart or somebody else to get a quote large share of the market. Um, why isn't that just a, a manifestation of the fact that as many, as I said, many millions of satisfied customers? And uh, so it also is at odds, if you know, in economics, the the uh, argument about economies of scale, There's a little mm -hmm. bit of a technical issue here, but scale means size. Economies of size means the bigger you get, the more you can spread your fixed costs out and lower your unit costs and and still make a lot of money while lowering the price you charge customers. Well, that's exactly what makes big business big. Its products become more affordable, but they become more affordable because they lower their unit costs. So there's a conflict even within economics, because on the one hand, economies of scale is supposed to be a good thing. On the other hand, if you actually get scale, and actually get size, the antitrust people start suspecting that you have market power, you know, and they come and they conflate that with uh, political power, the power to coerce. So, uh, but I, I would also say what you said at the outset, it, it is, it is, I think, a problem at um, uh, word wise, so to speak, that that capitalism sounds like capital, sounds like capitalists, and sounds like the system for capitalists. And uh, we have to resist that, but it's unavoidable, I think, in the word that people are going to go to. Uh, well, if capitalism is just this system of favors to this specific one group, reminds me of uh, the Labour Party in Britain. You know, it's a political party, but it's for what? Just labor? It sounds mm -hmm. uh, it sounds privileged. It sounds improper. And uh, so that that is a difficulty. What else do you call it? I, I'm reluctant to call it free market. Can, a free market because that's only the economics of it and there's way more i think having to do with constitutionally limited government the protection of property rights liberty you could call it liberalism in the you know mises for example has a whole book called liberalism he he himself was reluctant to use the word capitalism the the word itself i have a chapter in the book on where the word came from it actually was coined by socialists in the, in the 1850s the word capitalism i, I mean and in a critical way, they portrayed it as just this kind of thing. It's a system of, by, and for the capitalists to rule at the expense of everyone else. So the the, the word for that today would be plutocrats or plutocracy, ruled by the rich. Um, so that's just some of the background. It is, it is one of the reasons even libertarians will shy away from using the word capitalism, uh, because it sounds like a favored system, a system uh, favoring one group. Right. And, and I think you know, part of my uh, goal here, you know, in working at a you know free market organization, working in a in a think tank, doing you know, trying to do public education of various kinds, is to I think get people to think of themselves as as economic actors, whether or not they are a captain of industry. So uh, there's some. There's some background to this in, you know, self-help books and, you know, personal success manuals, you know, where yeah. uh, they'll use the, the, the metaphor that you're the CEO of your own career, or you're the CEO yeah. of your own life, of your right. own household. And, and I, and some of that advice gets, gets a little corny at times, but I, I think there's something there, which is that we, we all have, we all have some power. We have uh demand and supply, right? Uh, the, the money in our household is used to buy things, and that's that's some economic power there. And uh, obviously, bargaining with our own labor, where you want to work, what jobs, you know, what skills you acquire, you know, do you do you ask for a raise? Do you try and find a new, better job? Yeah. Yeah. Those are all things that are perfectly understandable within the context of economics. But people don't, most people don't think of it that way, right? They don't think of themselves as making quote economic decisions. People are more likely, I think, to think of themselves as sort of pawns being buffeted yeah. around by economic forces without yeah. a lot of agency. And so yeah. part of, you know, my goal in getting people to understand what capital capitalism is, is that it's just people exchanging value. It's not tech billionaires with mega yachts, or it's certainly not just that. Well put. I, the other thing I play around with, which I think is kind of fun, is uh, I lo always love uh, etymology, the origin of words. 
And capitalism goes back to capitalists and capital and capital is tools and equipment we use to create wealth. And interestingly, cap, uh, everybody knows this, the root of cap in Latin is basically head. Uh, if you're decapitated, you lose your head. If you're the captain of a team, you're the head of a of a team. The capital of a country is the head of the government. So cap is used in a, a capstone in a, in a bridge, is the head of things. And how about this? Instead of capitalism as the system you know, that benefits cronies on Wall Street, who are financiers, it's the system unique to human beings. Because human beings really do differ from animals in the sense that we have reason, we have rationality, we have this wonderful capacity for imagination and thought and creativity and entrepreneurship and all the things you talked about way beyond just economics. Of course, it's true in the arts and the sciences and medicine and things like that, right? Well, what about a system? I call it the habitat for humanity, just to take a word from a phrase from other uh, people. Uh, capitalism is the supreme habitat for humanity. It's the one that protects the brains, so to speak. Uh, not everyone's a brainiac, but everyone has to use their brains and their intelligence to some degree in the way, some of the ways you described. Some people are smarter than others, but the key is if you can get a system that protects the freedom to think and the freedom to act on your thinking, that is unique in human history. And that's how I like to think of capitalism. And thankfully, the word, it's in the word, and we need to recapture that from the critics of capitalism. But here's another way, Richard, uh, you, you know this, that uh, the word capital itself and I think this is a good thing. I've, I've gotten some pushback on this, but I think it's a good thing that over the years, economists have expanded means of capital to, uh, you know, say tangible capital might be equipment in a factory, mm -hmm. but financial capital is the way you fund businesses. Intellectual property, uh, that kind of capital is a different kind of, you know, patents and copyrights. But Gary Becker uh, spoke of human capital, human capital being the things you mentioned, your skills, your experience your uh, level of knowledge, your uh, education and things like that. So people building up their human capital, uh, certainly something you want to see. You don't want the erosion of human capital. You don't want it hurt by a system, say, of public education or other means. So there are all these ways that these are assets uh, just looked at from different perspectives. There's even a concept called social capital, which I kind of like. And social capital, Fukuyama has written on this. Social capital is the idea that there's trust within a culture. Some cultures, for various reasons, culture and otherwise, people tend to uh, be benevolent and reciprocal with each other, trust, trusting in each other instead of instead of being paranoid. And and obviously that's going to be a much better culture than one that lacks that social capital. So that's another way to handle the capital thing, to think of all the, the wonderful and different varied ways that capital exists and helps human life. And if you have a system that has an ism of that, capitalism, it protects uh, all those things and, and not just uh, business capital. Yeah. And, and I think that the idea of having, uh, you know, social capital that applies even within a firm, within sort of a workforce. You know, we might just call it uh, um, esprit de corps or morale or something yes, like that. Right. Um, but there, are, there's certainly plenty of, you know, if you go to the uh, our, our friends in the the business schools and you go into the case studies, uh, employee morale uh, is, is is considered to be one of the most important things for some very successful companies like South, you know, right. Kelleher at Southwest Airlines is famous for uh, yeah. incorporating uh, great social capital among his workforce. Um, By the and, way, Richard, I, I, you mentioned uh, working at CEI. I've known, I just want to say something. I've, I've known CEI and your work for many, many years. And I so love what you guys do. And you're such trailblazers also on the, on the whole issue of regulation. There's very few uh, think tanks out there that are have metrics for regulation and it's not, not an easy thing to measure all the time or the effects of it. I know you've been doing that for years, but I think, I think it's also interesting that it's called think tanks. So we're on this issue here of thinking, reason, the uniquely human way of going at the world. And, and, the, and, and we really need think tanks. We really need also, I mean, you're in Washington, I know, there's a special uh, lack of, uh, uh, intelligence i think going on in washington so to have groups of people nearby who uh uh bring together intellectual capital and and they're literally called think tanks to bring to bear a more rational analysis and more rational guidance to public policy is a wonderful thing but notice it's it's also in this theme of thinking which is so important 
Yeah, and it was really that was uh, you know our, our founder Fred Smith and and our our, our longtime uh, fellow uh, Wayne Cruz, who is now the Fred Smith Fellow, uh, were you know uh, yeah. you know Fred's idea to to create a think tank focused on uh, on regulation, right. not just spending and defense and things. Right, and then, right. Uh, Wayne's uh long now over 25 years uh doing his uh famous Amazing. report 10,000 yeah. commandments it's actually yeah. significantly more than 10,000 now but yeah. um uh but actually I think that's that's interesting because one of one of the things that a lot of people in the you know the history of capitalism have talked about um now we have now we have what's called the new history of capitalism with it, right. is essentially anti-capitalist but in right. sort of yeah. uh, yeah. traditional understanding of uh, capitalism is that it was very much a, a, an American thing, right? Americans didn't invent capitalism, but Americans have been probably the greatest exemplars and American society has been more pro-capitalist than almost any place else. Um, and, and, and I think the, the, the non-governmental part of the economy, right? You have all the pro for-profit businesses, but then you have this the space where CEI and other think tanks and policy groups are the nonprofit world, uh, that includes you know uh, funding for university study centers, includes independent organizations and advocacy groups and education. That is even more. It's even more lopsided that that sector of the economy is much bigger in the United States than it is even in almost as rich countries, right? If you go to yeah. Europe. Yeah, Western Europe, they have political organizations that are that are not nominal, you know, not 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 for profit, um, but either they are a subset of a university or they are actually funded by taxpayer money because the governments go and give each of the major political parties a little money and they set up their own little think tank to promote their own, uh, you know, partisan set of ideas. But this this idea that we have this enormous nonprofit sector voluntary sector yeah. right yeah. where people donate millions and millions of dollars to sometimes tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to advocate for the ideas they believe in and make the world hopefully a better place uh, but where they have uh, you have a, a society that's wealthy enough to support that but also free and diverse enough that there's no there's no rule on who can start up a nonprofit organization. You don't have to pass a litmus test. You don't have to get the government's permission, uh, and that people see value in that, not just in always trying to go to the government and get a law that's passed in their favor. Although there's too much of that as well. That yeah. I think is something yeah. that a, a lot of friends, people I know from different you know places in Europe, other other wealthy countries have said that we just don't really have anything like this over there. It's a really good point, and I think it highlights the the really, really underappreciated aspect of capitalism. Now we don't we don't have a pure capitalist system anymore, but it's predominantly that, and the trailing influence, of course. Of and now in this case, you're talking about philanthropy, and interestingly, back to etymology, philanthropy means love. Of, philo means love. Anthropy is human love of humanity. Uh, that it's voluntary that in America, the voluntary private sector, private charity sector is huge. And it's not only funding think tanks, but of course, you know, wings of medical hospitals and libraries. And Carnegie was big on this uh, when he made his well, Carnegie Hall, the range of the things we have. Whereas in Europe, the long tradition had been the state would fund it, the state would establish it, including religion, by the way. So the separation of religion and state in America did, did not prevent, obviously, people from contributing to religion, but left more for religious liberty. It's a wonderful thing, but notice it's very much at odds with the critique of capitalism. The The argument would be, since it's a egoistic, which I think agree that is true, it's a self-interested system, the argument is, well, why would there be any self-interest in being a philanthropist? Well, because we have values. We've created such an abundance of wealth. We have also a gratitude and appreciation for this system. You hear that all the time from philanthropists, they'll say, I'm so grateful to have lived in this great country and built this great business. And now I, I hate when they say I want to give back to the community because I don't think they took anything to begin with. But still, it's a kind of it's a very kind of generosity thing. And it's a very liberal in a good sense thing and totally unique to capitalism. And that maybe you're leveraging off of what I said earlier about social trust. Uh, other cultures that don't have social trust, they're certainly not going to be a as philanthropic as America is. It, it also interests me when you said in the beginning, America is seen as more like kind of quintessentially capitalist. I think that confirms my view. 
and my position that capitalism is way more than just economics. Because mm-hmm. think of it, you will often hear people say, why are you honing in on capitalism or why do you think it's unique to any recent period? There's always been capital markets. There's always been goods and trading. And it goes back to, you know, Egyptian times. There's always mark. And, and when you look at it that way, it is kind of true. There's always been markets. Uh, they were nor- enormously suppressed under medieval times, of course. But to me, that means uh, that, that that's not the essence of it, that that's part of it but that capitalism really is only something like two or 300 years old, but unique in the sense of the British, it's really the British and American, the industrial revolutions came to those two countries because they believed in constitutionally limited government. They believed in the rule of law, the separation of powers. You know, they had defects, obviously they had slavery, but these two countries uh, got rid of slavery, you know, because it was inconsistent with their basic fundamentals. And so I, I think that's a way to start beginning to see that, wait a minute, capitalism is way more than just economics, way, way more than just markets. And that's why the world, including the critics, that's why they tend to say that Britain and America are quintessentially capitalist, because they know it's these other institutional aspects um, that are that are an important part of the system, individual rights and things like that, which you don't find in other places, even though they might have markets. Well, yeah, and, and when it goes to the question of you know even even capitalism critics will understand you know X Y and Z uh, aspect of it. Uh, I wonder what to what extent uh, you know capitalism's critics there, uh, and not sort of the the wishy washy people in the middle, but the real you know kind of strong ideological critics uh, are critical of it for its virtues or what we would consider its virtues, which is that they actually do prefer a society that is tightly controlled, that doesn't have freedom. Uh, right. Or how many people are opposed to it, suspicious of capitalism because of things that they're simply mistaken about, right? The you know Because the part of the criticism, like you referred to earlier, said that people assume that capitalism will uh, inevitably end up running towards monopoly and uh, you know monopoly rents and control and constricted production and higher prices. Uh, which I think we would say in a in a in a more laissez-faire system wouldn't actually happen. Um, so, are do you think the 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 capitalism haters they really hate it for what we think are its virtues, or they hate it for what we think they're mistaken about its vices? I would lean in this in the second direction. The longer I've studied this, and the more I've taught it, the more I think the objections are not economic. Uh, by the way, there's a there's a one of the wonderful things at Duke. I have a seminar I've been teaching now. I think I'm going on my sixth year for first year students only. Capitalism for and against is the seminar. Uh, it's a small group. It's no more than twenty, and half the readings are pro capitalist and half the readings are anti capitalist. And uh, what's interesting about that is the way I structure it is I. I say for each of these groups we study, you know, the socialists, then Keynesians, then Austrian economists, then libertarians and conservatives, you know, go back and forth, environmentalists, objectivists, all for and against. But what I ask them to ask in each case is create a column that asks, what does this group think capitalism is? In other words, how do they define it? But then here's the key. Do they think it's moral? Do they think it's practical? Do they think it's sustainable? And I do it in that order because these views, uh, these groups for and against do have a view in each of the realms. And what's interesting is so Marx, for example, Marx is on record saying capitalism is hugely practical and productive. I mean, yes, he has the critiques of monopoly and has the critiques of exploitation, which are, are wrong. And that leads him to say it's not sustainable, right? It's going to collapse of its own inner contradictions. But the point is on every level, he has an answer, and and he and he does say it has this productive prowess that has completely eclipsed feudalism. But what he says is it's evil, and, and why is it evil? Because it's based on self interest. And then and he goes further and say, and self interest, its commercial manifestation is what every everyone would agree. The commercial manifestation of self interest is the profit motive. I mean, they literally call it the profit motive, the motive mm-hmm. to gain, you know, create to create net value. Now he sees profit as theft. But but in a way, there's a real truth there that um, that this moral dimension to it. So so if capitalism is based on self-interest, not the Nietzschean self-interest of running off shot over others, but just advancing your own life, improving your own prospects, putting yourself first, but then other loved ones and significant ones 
uh, uh, come second, they're still important to you. If that's the system it's enshrining, if you look, there's a long history of hatred of that. Uh, biblical, otherwise, even utilitarians, there is a long suspicion and hatred of the self-interest motive. One of the great achievements of Adam Smith the founder, really, of political economy was to say, wait a minute, whoa, slow down here a bit. Self-interest is a good thing. Now, now, he was mixed on this. He said it's a good thing because it leads to the wealth of nations and a harmony of interests among the factors of production. But it, but it was just in the economic realm. You know, he, mm -hmm. his more theory of moral sentiment said, well, you can't be a fully moral person if you're self-interested through and through in every aspect of your life. But again, I think the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, these new newfound respect for reason and science and logic that occurred in the 17th and 18th centuries, that's why we were able to get, get capitalism, because a more rational view and a more sympathetic view to self-interest developed. So that's a long answer, but I, I, I'm really... Even though I'm trained as an economist and I got my PhD in political economy, over the years I have come to realize and, and think that the real animosity toward capitalism is this idea that it's not moral. Uh, the whole social justice movement, you know, again, is another example of that. Capitalism is considered unjust because there's unequal results or unjust because it's eating up the planet. But you, you, and, you and I know, Richard, that, that the economic fallacies associated with what causes depressions, what causes business cycles, what causes monopolies, the, those have been refuted and smashed thousands of times by economists. And there's really, and, and just the practical track record of socialism versus capitalism is so obvious, even to the most obtuse, that you have to look elsewhere for what the mm -hmm. issue is. And uh, I think the elsewhere to look is this moral argument, which economists, you know, are not comfortable with. They really are not. They, they separate what normative and positive economics. The positive is supposed to be the science oriented economics and normative is what should be done or what, what the moral thing to do. And, you know, they shy away from that. They're very reluctant to go there. So they want to give only economic arguments for capitalism. Right. Well, that, that actually sounds like a... Uh... The seminar you described sounds like uh, it would be fascinating. I wish I could go back in time and uh, and take that myself. A uh, an economics course at an American university that is only fifty percent anti capitalist is about fifty right, percent right. less than than usual. Right. There was a when a, that it would, did not exist on the on the uh, in the course catalog, and when I was asked to come up with a new seminar for freshmen, I said, uh, "What about capitalism for and against?" And they said, "What do you mean?" So I had to submit a uh, a proposal, you know, to the curriculum committee, and uh, thankfully it was approved, of course. But, but uh, someone jokingly came back and said, "What do you mean for?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there have been. It's not that capitalism hasn't been covered at universities and at Duke and elsewhere, but they're usually critiques. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the students, the students are really. It's very interesting because I'll ask them, of course, why they're taking the seminar. The the motivations are very interesting. Sometimes a student will say. I lean toward capitalism, but I don't really know the arguments beyond economics. Sometimes they'll say I'm a socialist and I hate capitalism. I just want to know all the other reasons why to hate it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is a mix. Some people are just uh, agnostic. They don't know one way or another and they want to learn. I had someone more recently, a student from China, one of the more interesting answers I ever got. She said, I'm taking this because I'm here Having grown up in China, I'm told that capitalism is terrible. I just want to hear if there's any arguments for it. Wow. So op open-minded as well in, in that kind of case. But uh, no, they get on the left, they will get Marx uh, on the left, I should say, on the anti-capitalist side. It mostly lines up as Marxist, socialist, Keynesian, environmentalist, some feminists. Um, then on the right, they'll get um, Mises, Hayek, Rand, Buchanan, Nozick. Those kind of names that you'll be familiar with, and uh, and we and we toggle back and forth, which is nice too. Instead of having half the semester anti-capitalism and half pro, each week we go back and forth. So the first one is mm -hmm. Marxist critique, and then critique of the Marxist critique, then Keynesian critique, then critique of the Keynesian critique. It's really cool. That's great, and I I, I mean I like what your your point about how economists are often. Uh, unwilling to make these uh, moral arguments about capitalism because they're more comfortable with uh, quantitative uh, type stuff. Uh, I wonder, let me ask you about another sort of uh, 
uh, duality here, which is the world of yeah. academic academic economists, and then the yeah. world of finance, like practical finance and investing. Uh, yeah. So you've you've got background in both both areas, yeah. being a finance guy, but then being you know university professor. What when it comes to some of these big picture issues, what do you think the each side misunderstands about the other? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, having seen both academic and what I would call business economists, um, the, and I was at banks for many years in the 80s and 90s. I worked at places like the Bank of New York and Citibank. At some, at one point, the major banks in New York and really around the world, they had economic departments. Believe it or not, they had they would hire PhD economists, and and you would see why if you could do that well and and have practical application, it would be very important to have a team of people who could predict and track the business cycle because uh, the business cycle consists of, you know, sectors rising and falling, cyclical and otherwise it's called. And for, in terms of lending money or in terms of guiding clients, you would want a bank to really know that kind of stuff. Um, eventually they got rid of their economics departments because their forecasting was so bad, which is so <laughs> tragic. I, it's one of the things I do is, is, is run a small investment research a business cycle forecasting firm for purposes of advising investors. But the, it, it goes this way. The business economists think, as you, the, no, no surprise here, that the academic economists are armchair, that they're just theorizing in the air, that they don't care about data, that they don't do number crunching. The business economists, on the other hand, are seen as the number crunchers. They're the ones who are on CNBC every week, you know, telling you what they think of the latest non-farm payrolls. I mean, that's equally... <laughs> That's equally desiccated because they're, you know, doing that kind of like blind empiricism or they're just reacting to the latest press release from the Fed or something like that. So the academic economists will see the business economists as myopic and in the weeds. And so they're both actually accurate in criticizing each other in, in all the sciences and economics uh, included, uh, just as a matter of epistemology, how we know. You have to have induction and deduction. You have to have induction in the sense of looking at the facts of reality and inducing from that broader concepts and principles. But you do have to be anchored in reality. You have to be anchored in the data. But, but equally, you have to be deductive. You have to, once having learned the principles, you need to be able to apply them. And uh, these two realms are sitting on either side of that and not integrated enough. So the better economists, the better scientists generally, the better economists, though, would would be equally comfortable theorizing and using concepts and principles to guide themselves, as well as uh, having the the details. Here's another thing I, I, I stress a lot at Duke and elsewhere, um, and this comes up typically in cases where you see really bad forecasting results. One of them would be Malthusian. Uh, Malth Robert Malthus, we know in the late 1700s, would predict that uh, population growth is going to outstrip food production. Mm -hmm. so, so which was false, but he just did not uh, conceive of productivity gains in agriculture. Uh, but another one is environmentalism. And you guys know this, you follow the environmental movement, how bad their forecasts are. And the students are somewhat familiar with this, but I'll tell them about it. And but here's the interesting thing, instead of just saying, hey, these people have a bad forecasting record, therefore dismiss them. If you understand the reason why a forecasting record would be flawed, I, I look at it this way. First, you have to, in any science, uh, gather the facts and gather the relevant facts. And that alone is uh, an important thing to do. But the next one is you use the facts and then come up with an explanation of the facts. So it's not just description, it's that next level of explanation, which really amounts to theorizing cause and effect, right? So instead of just being in the swim of the numbers, not knowing how they relate, you got to get to that next level of, I'm going to explain why A causes B in such and such a context. Now, still we're not done. That's just the second level. The last one would be predictive. If you've described the facts well, if you have a good causal model, you should be able to have decent forecasting results. So I stress these uh, this kind of tripartite approach to science, because if you find a group with very bad forecasting record, it's probably because their theories are wrong or, you know, they haven't been attuned to the actual facts. So um, it's it's not scientific, but it's not that prediction is irrelevant. It should be part of a kind of a check on whether your causal models are right. And, and that is totally lacking in, in economic forecasting. It's one of the reasons it has had such a bad reputation. On finance, Richard, though, I would say 
It's a little more rational in finance, investments, portfolio management there. There, I think over the years, the finance professors have done a fairly decent job of teaching people what it means to diversify their assets, to uh, construct portfolios in such a way that they can maximize risk-adjusted returns. I mean, the kind of things I'm saying right now are, are a subset of economics. It's called financial economics. And uh, although lots of people today are still ignorant of personal finance or how to put together their investment portfolios or how to do estate planning, it's not as if the tools aren't there. The tools in, in financial economics and investment and investment strategy are much better, I have found, than in economics broadly. Well, yeah, and I think, and this is something I, I try and follow on uh, uh, on YouTube and social media, the places where non-experts go, uh, yeah. that there is an increasing sort of hobby interest, if you will, in yeah. uh, financial economics and investing in, right. in a way that there probably wasn't in previous generations. And there certainly doesn't seem to be in, in most uh, other countries where you have, um, you know, you have uh, undergraduates in their uh, dorm rooms hosting, you know, finance and investing YouTube channels. Now, right. maybe, yeah. maybe they wanted you to yeah. put all your money into FTX, you know, yeah. uh, six right. months ago. Uh, but the fact that there is this widespread enthusiasm for wanting to know what you know what what markets are doing wanting to know what the yes. fed chairman is saying yeah um among not not everyone in america but a lot more people than have a, a you know a direct professional interest in it uh this kind of democratization of investing which you know yeah. started with mutual funds and now etfs and you know everyone now has an investing app on their phone and they could trade you know seamlessly for zero or near zero commissions uh this strikes me as an as an evolution of populist in in the best way. Yes. Sometimes uh, populist uh, economics uh, are not are, are not executed in the best way, but uh, with lowered barriers to entry, uh, lowered fees, uh, and and more people taking control. Now that we have fewer defined benefit pensions and we have more individual retirement accounts, that that these things that this sort of movement is going to cause people to become more aware of things like financial markets and aware of bad public policy and law and taxes, which will reduce their returns over time, which I yeah. think is a, a pretty uh, optimistic thing. Yeah, that's a great observation. In the 70s, uh, I got to Wall Street in the late 70s. You still had to call up a broker on the phone, like at EF Hutton or something, mm -hmm. and execute a trade. And the thing costs like $25 per trade. The whole idea of Schwab, discount brokerage, uh, online, everything we have today, not, not even online now, it's just on your phone. Um, is it Robinhood? I hate the name of it. Robinhood, yeah. <laughs> that new app that young kids use to trade. Yeah. But yeah, but anything that permits people to more directly be, get to Wall Street, so to speak, to trade. It's not just Wall Street, of course, it's global is wonderful. I agree with you. And, and the, the other thing I think it teaches, I've often uh, stressed to students and elsewhere that, you know, one of the sectors least trusted and least understood in capitalism is the financial sector. It's so complex. I think it's where most of the brainiacs are, frankly. It's not really in agriculture. It's not really in manufacturing and somewhat in service sector. But there's something about people who go into finance. It's a very technical, very advanced field and really requires a lot of intelligence. But the, tr but the standard view is that that sector is parasitic. That, that also comes from Marx, the labor theory of value, the idea that all value is just created by muscles, you know, by mm -hmm. physical sweating labor by blue collar workers on an assembly line. So what's the opposite of that? You know, white collar workers uh, with bow ties working on Wall Street. They think these people are just paper shufflers. Uh, really what they're doing is using their brains to figure out how to allocate capital, to raise capital, to allocate capital, to pick winners and losers, to invest in the right products, industries. They have to judge management. They have to be judged they have to be a judge of uh, the, the leadership capabilities of managers. It's an enormously difficult thing. It's one of the reasons people burn out. They, the reason they burn out on Wall Street, it is so intellectually demanding and they really do add value. So, but if you say that to the average American, you know, I, I like to just to be exaggerating about it. I'll say the most productive sector in the economy is finance, Wall <laughs> Street. They have no idea what you're talking about. 
And part of it is just ignorance of what the field is. And if you're ignorant of a field, you're suspicious of it. But uh, it's just not commonly realized. Now, if you try to invest on your own and find how difficult it is to quote unquote, what do they call it? Beat the market. Yeah. It's so damn difficult to beat the market. That, that should tell people how difficult it is. It's not something you can easily do. And it takes a lot of work and a lot of time. And you realize it's a full-time thing. But you're right, in terms of the tools available to people to at least explore and investigate and try their hand at investing, um, that is certainly something that capitalism has delivered. All right. Well, Professor Salzman, thank you for a great conversation. This has been fascinating. I feel like we could go we could go all day, but we will uh we won't try the patience of our listeners. <laughs> Good. I enjoyed it uh, enormously. Hope we can do it again sometimes. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. And just before we go, tell people where they can find you, find your writing, find your books. Well, the all uh, the all purpose place to go is richardsalsman.com. So I do have a personal website and that's kind of like a hub and spoke system that'll get you to four or five other places I do work at, including Duke, including American Institute for Economic Research, AIER.org. You can get my essays. My public essays are available there. And I also work for the Atlas Society, which which promotes the uh, philosophy and ideas of Ayn Rand. So I'm into three or four different things that might interest people, but just go to richardsalsman.com. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard. Take care.